Okay, so here we are. Um, raster data, remote sensing. And the interesting thing for me is that, again, ArcGIS and remote sensing, so there used to be kind of a, a GIS and remote sensing was somewhat a separate discipline and, and we're seeing merging. When I first started taking uh, some remote sensing classes uh, through a workshop offered by NASA Goddard Space Center, um, ESRI did not have the capabilities to look at any uh, remotely, uh, remote sense data or data in multiple band, and now they do. And so that stuff is really merging, um, and it's kind of interesting to watch how this is going. So the book takes you through vector and raster data models, um, and then uh, talks about raster formats. So um, let's think about that. What's, what's one thing, I mean, if you had to define for somebody what is raster or what is a vector data, what, how would you describe that? Anybody want to yell it out? Josh? Point, polygon, polyline. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think that's a good way. What else could you add to that? It scales. You want to tell me more about that? Like a point will, uh, so like with a, comparing it to a raster, right? Mm -hmm. If you zoom in really far on a raster, you get big pixels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The pixels themselves are scaling. Whereas a point or a polygon or a line, you can zoom in and zoom mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. and it'll scale to whatever. So the line and the point for sure, because they, they don't have that third dimension. The polygon will probably scale the same as rasters, because that's we've got that 3D, but that's a good point. Anything else about ra vector data? That you know, flat. How do you how do you mean that? I'm not sure. I just feel like it's the, the topography I'm looking at is kind of feeling flat, so that I I'm not sure. Okay, she's saying it's dimensional. flat. Raster's 3D. Hmm. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Great. So what's the little rhyme we we kind of were learning? No, raster is faster, but vector is corrector. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So uh, point lines and polygons, um, they're really good for g getting a more realistic picture, right, of the landscape. Um, they're, they're kind of a simpler um, format in some ways. It's X and Ys, right, coordinates around that. Uh, Shape files. What other formats do we see vector data in? So we looked at feature classes, right? Features of feature classes. You can also get them in coverages. The old format where where you had uh, arcs and and uh, vertices. That whole old coverage format. Okay, raster data. Um, so have you guys? Did we use any vector data in the last? Terms. What did we What did we do with vector? Yeah, network analysis with roads. Yeah, so they're not all simple. I mean, we could do a lot of a lot of analysis with with vector data. Um, we did the social kind of the social uh, polygons on counties and block groups and the census data. We use vector data for that, so it has uh, a wide use. Raster data. Have we used raster data at all? Yep. So, give me an example. Hillshade. Yeah, we hillshade, view sheds, uh, DEM contours, all that stuff. We kind of used raster data, and you can see in some ways this is considered a simple, a simplified format because it's just a, a grid. Although these should be square, and I don't know if I. If I pick, if I stretch that image, I may have. Um, it, you can have rectangular, but usually they're square. Um, and so this is one that would have a, a unique classification, right? So each grid is representing some kind of land use or some kind of, of uh, function. Um, so there's all different ways to show raster data. So um, Esri, that first uh, tutorial takes you through kind of a comparison of when you use one and when you use the other. So th they're calling raster data simple, and it's also larger data volumes. 
in order to store that. Um, and the topology, remember those, those connections and associations? There aren't any uh, identified in raster. Those are just kind of built in. But with vector data, you have uh, specific topologies that you have to set up to maintain those line integrity so you don't have gaps between polygons or so that you don't have overlap. Raster automatically takes care of that so you don't have to identify topology. Um, the resolution of, uh, of a vector is set by the coordinates um, and in raster it's by the pixel size. And then this is where I really, I did a lot of looking on the internet because Esri has these as um, vector as less detailed and raster as more detailed. And that's not how I conceive of those. I think of vector data as being able to show much more detail in the landscape and raster data generalizing unless you have little tiny squares. And so there was something in the reading that said depending on your resolution your um, detail is increased or decreased. But, so I think this is incorrect. You guys, as you're reading through, see if you can, maybe that will make sense to you when I miss something. <laughs> um, why would the analysis in vector be more difficult than the analysis in raster? And let's just talk about land use overlay. Yeah. Right, right. If I have created raster data of soils and raster data of precipitation, those cells are going to just land on top of each other with identical corners and coordinates. But vector, I I'm going to have some overlap and some won't line up. And so that's when we were doing a lot of the um, uh, dissolving and trying to end up with the small fragments, you know, that would meet a, a criteria. So the Doing spatial analysis with vector when you're looking at aerial analysis like that, you really have to kind of think about how you want to do that. Not that you don't with raster, but you've got to, you know, you can't just categorize the whole landscape. Um, performance, apparently vector is faster and raster is slower. Um, however, I think that's not how we think about that either. I think we think of raster is faster and vector is corrector. So I have, a l I have issues with some of the ESRI uh, so data. Maybe. That could be. That'd be worth looking into. Right. So again, that could depend on, uh, you know, I know when we were doing raster analysis, sometimes that thing would just crank and crank and crank. So um, that, that little poem may not work anymore. Okay. And matching geographic space. Um, rasters are often complete in that they cover a whole landscape, right? They're often just kind of um, a continuous uh, image, not always. One thing you're going to do in the first or second lab is convert. If you haven't done that before, um, sometimes you want your data in, uh, in one format or the other. And so you can convert raster to vector and vector to raster. Um, and uh, you lose some information, but sometimes you can get information that you couldn't get any other way. Let's say I'm looking at soils, and it's raster data in soils, and I have road data, and I want to overlay the road data over the soils and figure out pixel by pixel what kind of soils my roads are on. If I take the raster data and or the vector data that's roads and turn it into rasters, then I can do a nice overlay. So there's some way, reasons that you would do that. All right. Which would you use to analyze tornado damage, raster or vector? What do you think, Dick? Rick. Uh huh. Raster. Talk to me about what you're thinking of when you're analyzing tornado damage. Okay. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, 
the computer program disagrees with you on one of them. Okay, so um, it doesn't disagree with you at all. Sorry, you're right. I had him backwards. Right, so um, yeah, it's saying that raster data would be great because you could do large aerial extent. You could classify the path of the tornado. You could find how many houses were damaged. And you could look at big areas. Um, and the museum location, you're just doing an XY vector point. So that's, that's pretty easy. Good job. Good putting yourself, me putting you on the spot. Okay. Uh, model water flow over land based on surface elevation. Jeffrey. Raster. Raster. I think he's corrector. All right. So, yeah. So this idea of modeling over space, using raster data for that is, is really useful. And um, I don't know, some of you in the capstone program, Jeff took a uh, DEM and converted that into streams, uh, into to polylines by using the slope and the runoff and the drainage. And so he was able uh, to kind of create streams where maybe there wasn't a stream file for that. So you can use that for those kinds of things. Ah, oh, Christina, what would you use for a railroad? Subway. Yeah. I th oh, sorry, you're not going to get to know the answer to that. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Polylines, right. So linear features, th the topology exists. Um, you know, you're not going to have uh, the trail maybe run over, overlay the railroad, you know, so you could set up those topologies unless you're going to cross only at right angles or some such thing, you could do that. How about represent buildings, Max? Ooh. Well, it's not going to let you see the answer to that either. Okay. Why do you think vote? So you do, say again. You could you could do, do height if you're using lidar. You can't do height with a regular DEM because it's not it's not getting that right. And you could use raster and and you'll get to practice doing that. But the trick with raster is how big is your pixel? So if you have pixels that are 50 meter by 50 meter or 100 meter by 100 meter, you're going to have a hard time picking out some buildings. So yes, you could. The nice thing about raster is you could do a large area really quickly. You know, With vector, you're going to have to kind of hand draw each of those. We've done that, uh, each of those little squares. OK, areas of poor plant growth on a farm. Well. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Again, I still think a lot of this has to do with, with the scale that you're working in, you know? If we did the, the farm garden out here, we wouldn't want to use raster, right? Yeah, so you kind of have to think about what is the project, how much time do you have to get, get on the ground and actually map it out, that kind of stuff. So, um, so then we talk about the grid structure uh, of raster data. In, in ESRI, um, the ESRI files are called grids. There's a bunch of different types of rasters that you'll, you'll learn the names of. But um, basically, they're identified. The size of a, of a raster is identified as the number of rows and columns within that, within that raster file. Um, and you'll always be given the cell resolution, so the size of each cell. So um, you'll know the cell size so that you'll know the, the resolution of that cell. So that will always be given in your properties and you'll spend a whole lot of time looking at that, unfortunately, um, in the first exercise. So again, if I look at this vector image on the front, you can really see how the, the uh, higher resolution, the smaller the, the cell size, the more accurate I can depict um, that landscape. But these files, when you have 16 by 16 cells, they get really huge really fast. And then, and then they're kind of a, a much slower uh, processor. Okay. Um, 
Um, so they did, and the ESRI kind of goes through some of the benefits, which are pretty obvious to you. Small self, uh, you get spatial accuracy, much more detail, um, but they take a long time to draw. Sometimes we've just sat there with that little spin or, you know, just kind of yeah. waiting for it to draw. Uh, the large size, less information. Uh, so often a lot of climate data you get is in 100 meter resolution. Um, it's, it, they're big, big cells because you're really not looking at microclimates. You're kind of looking at the variation over larger areas. So 100 meter, uh, sometimes even bigger, is, is accurate. Um, if we want to, uh, I think Joseph made the point that sometimes the new LIDAR DEMs, there's almost too much noise. You know, that you, you just see too much detail. And I tried to do a campus contour map um, just running the DEM from campus, and it was, you know, every little bump um, showed up. So it was almost too much information. Um, so there's, there's, you know, pluses and minuses with each of those. So I just said that. You need to also kind of what's available, how much time. Sometimes uh, the interesting thing is that you get, um, let's say you have soils data in run resolution and climate data in another resolution and you want to do an analysis, then you're going to have to uh, resample. And what you can do is either take one of the, sam one of the uh, files and you know, cut each cell in, in quarters to match the other resolution or you summarize one of them, right? So you can actually uh, compare or change your raster data so that they will line up and be the same pixel size. But then you need to decide which way do you need to go, you know? Is it more accurate to splice one in half or in quarters or is it more accurate to summarize the other? So there's all kinds of things to think about when you do that. Um, one of the things, Brenda ran into this this summer, and um, she had data that was um, the same pixel size, but one was very easy to see, the resolution was great, and the other, the resolution was not as great. Is that right? Is that the same situation? And so when I was going through the Esri file, I found this, is that a lot of it has to do with the, how the image was taken and what the display scale is. So even though our cell size are the same, our actual display of the image may be dramatically different. And so I'm thinking, well, I've got one meter resolution, and yet one I can see and the other I can't. So it has to do with, with this, and they'll take you through some of that. Yeah. Um, so how do you know, you know, we don't have the, the um, latitude and longitude points aren't integral to the entire raster, but they do set up your origin. Um, and so there's usually one XY coordinate that indicates the northwest corner of a raster and everything is built from that. Raster addresses our cell uh, row, column and row, or row and column, what is that? It is column and row. Okay, row and column, thank you. Yeah, two, three. So they're, they're identified by their uh, row and column. All right. Um, when we get into the uh, uh, ESRI data, um, sometimes you want to gather a region of interest. You don't want the whole LIDAR image to study. You just need a smaller, uh, smaller piece of that. And so you need to be able to identify um, a region of interest extent. And usually what, what that is is to be able to identify the four corners with lat and long. Um, sometimes with, co with, with row, and co or column, row and column, but the lat and long is easier to identify. So um, you'll be using some of that, being able to kind of subsample that way. Then when we get into the raster analysis, really what we're working on is images that were collected uh, or information that was collected across the electromagnetic spectrum with multi-sensored satellites. Um, and so there are satellites that can select or that can collect image um, in this wider range than just the visible spectrum. 
and so it will collect uh, infrared, near-infrared, thermal information, and each of those sensors or channels uh, collects a signal or a value, and those values can be used then to create images or create um, different emphasis on an image. Sure. So we'll, we'll look through that um, in a little bit in um, the raster display and then again when we get into um, the NV software. So when we look at elevation data, so DEMs, those are usually given um, a single band. Did I make that? No, I forgot. Whoops. Uh, Landsat images can be anywhere from one single band up to seven bands of, of information across the electromagnetic scale. Um, and black and white uh, aerial photos are usually in single band as well. So we'll go through that in the Esri uh, format. I'm, I'm, or the Esri tutorial. I talked about the different raster formats. Um, these are the common ones that people use, TIFF images. Um, we can always bring in a TIFF. Uh, one of the problems with a TIFF is it may not have any spatial reference. So I can, uh, I can scan a map on my scanner and cr save it as a TIFF, and I can bring it into ArcMap, but it has no location. It's just going to show up wherever. So then you have to go through the process of georeferencing that and giving it a location. Uh, DEM, digital elevation model, we've worked with. Um, MRCID is uh, another, um, I think that's the USGS um, uh, DEM or, or uh, elevation data, and they have a really nice uh, graphic for downloading. You can select an area and download it and then convert it and bring it into ArcMap. So there's a lot of uh, elevation data uh, available in, in other kind of raster formats. Um, a GIF, you can bring that in. Again, you have to georeference it. I think we did that with um, some of our Google Earth images and then would, and then have to georeference them to something. Erdos Imagine, I've never worked with that, uh, but that's another format you may run into. And also a JPEG. Again, you have to georeference that one, but you can bring a JPEG in. Um, I can, you know, I can bring in a picture of my daughter onto my ARC map, and she's not spatially located, so. Uh, have to georeference her. Anyway, um, so TIFF is probably the most common. Um, it it supports uh, a, a lot of satellite imagery is is uh, saved in TIFFs. Um, so you'll run into those a lot. Uh, okay. So then when we get into your raster data, you're going to notice that um, the attribute tables can be quite different. And so um, if you have a uh, raster with an attribute table, you open it and you see a value, a count, a type, an area. Actually, if you can open it at all, um, then that raster is an integer, OK? Um, rasters that are not in integers, you, they don't have an attribute table. Um, and you need to, uh, if you actually need that attribute table, you have to convert that uh, floating point raster to an integer, and you can do that pretty easily in, in ARC uh, spatial analyst in the, in the map or in the math um, module. So um, attributes in an attribute table, it's called a VAT, value attribute table. I don't know why it has to be called differently, but it is. Um, and the count um, indicates how many cells have that value, right? So you can see that the largest uh, area in this little raster is water. Oh, no, I'm wrong. It's ID3, number th 15. Yeah, I don't know what ID3 is, but there it is. There's a lot of it. I think it's this one here. Well, I think because there could be so many, um, I can find the value of each cell just by using the ID tool. So if I use the ID tool and clicked on this cell, it would give me the value. Um, and, um, but I think because uh, one of the nice things with this, though, uh, if I were to take this and turn it into vector data, 
I could do that in a couple ways where I could maintain each grid as a separate polygon, or I could have it consolidate so that anything that was um, contiguous would, would be added. So I would end up with one, two, three, four, five polygons instead of uh, whatever the number this is. So no other grid would separate? Then they would be separate polygons. So would they be a number connected to the polygon? If I, if I change them into vectors, yes. But if I had, if these were not contiguous, if I had a blue polygon in the northwest corner, it would still be 15. So it's looking at the whole raster data and how many of these cells. And the easy thing is you can find area really quick. Because if I know the cell size and I know there's 15 of them, I can tell you what the area is. And, and my guess would be you could also use this for grid calculation. So if you wanted to know how much of a area of that uh, silver layer versus sandy rocky soil, or if you want to know how much of a section is water versus marsh versus dry land, or anything like that. So my guess would be that would allow you to do calculations. Absolutely. Um, yeah, new calculus. Yeah, and I, I don't know if, if when you've got, you know, 40,000 grids or 30,000 grids, if the attribute table would be so long, you know, if you had an individual, you know, cell and the number, if that would just be unwieldy or they just found most people summarizing so they're, they're displaying it this way. But that is, that is different. Um, so if I, if I right-click my properties and went to attributes and nothing happened so it was grayed out, that's probably because integer. But one of the problems is sometimes it's a decimal and it'll truncate that decimal. So if my floating point is 1.23, um, it'll truncate it to a 1. Or if it's 0.5, it'll truncate it to a 0. So often you take your raster data and you multiply it by 10 or 100 or whatever you need to move it uh, to, to a larger number so that when you truncate it, it's, it's a lot of just trying to keep track of what that value is and what it means. Do you know what the ratio was with that? Um, I don't. How, so you mean if it's over this, do this? Well, I think you'd want to. I think you would want to move everything up by the same amount. So you'd want to multiply everything by ten, so that now you can truncate and end up with a one as your lowest value. So that would be, I think you're talking about when I want to go and classify it now, yeah. then that's where you can decide. But to classify it, it has to be an integer. Well, we, you can try it, Will. Maybe, maybe you can. But we, we'll take a look. Um, so lots of ways to get raster data, aerial images, LIDAR images, third Thermal images, radar, you'll go work with all of that. Um, we've done a lot of just taking uh, screenshots and, and georeferencing those or um, scanning uh, a TIFF or a JPEG. And again, those have to be georeferenced. And you can also, they talked about making uh, raster data sets from GPS data on the surface. And I just can't even imagine, do I have the image of that, what that would take. You'd have to go out in a regular grid, take a point, and then take that point and have that point converted to a raster giving it cell size. It could be, it could be quite the process. I have no idea. I have no idea. 
Okay, so once you've got raster data, there's just a bunch of stuff that you can do with that. Um, this is obviously, I mean, you guys can tell this is a LIDAR image, right? That the hill shade, just, I mean, look at the detail. And the other way is the buildings, you can still kind of see the building footprint. And LIDAR will, uh, you can smooth LIDAR data to get rid of buildings. And, but it makes, you can still see the footprint. So hill shade, uh, slope, aspect, um, you can do flow maps, you can do a mosaic, and then um, a, a classification uh, by themes. And so that's the soil maps that might have had a number, um, and I want to kind of give them some kind of, of uh, label or different text name. Then you can, you can reclassify data. We'll do a lot of reclassifying in the uh, remote sensing part. Um, okay, so. When you go through the, the, the tutorial, it gives you a lot of information about when you would use different kinds of data. So if I want to use a, a land use study, um, I, I want to use, I want to take that data and create a thematic raster. So is it urban, is it agricultural, it, you know, how is it zoned? So I want to, I want to be able to identify that differently um, rather just than just numbers, um, and I want to probably group them. A base map for field use, I would use an ortho photo. Um, and um, well we've used a lot of those, and now you know they're streaming. They're really easy to get. Um, in fact, we now have options, which one is best depending on how much angle and what the date is, and is a tree leaf on or leaf off. There's all kinds of options for using uh, base maps that are ortho photos or streamed imagery. Um, topographic relief displacement. Okay, so you want a DEM. Um, a topographic map is just a scanned map, and you're going to be able to see contour lines, but um, with the DEM, you can do some surface analysis and actually look at changes in relief. Okay. I thought this one was tricky. Distinguish land water edges. Am I going to use a flow accumulation or a, ras a thematic raster? I don't know. I'm not sure. Ah, thematic raster. Um, so, again, I, I think a lot of this has to do with the size of pixels. So, thematic raster of a coarse resolution isn't going to give you really good edges. But a flow accumulation would be something like to, to do hydrology and movement down a raster, but just to look at the edges, you want it to be considered uh, riparian edge or water or hillside. You know, you could create a theme like that. So basically, that's the content area for this chapter, um, and um, I think probably a lot of new terminology, but as far as actually working with the software,